We're going to ask uh, Rabbi Mendelevich to say a few words to us. He's going to sign your books as well, take your questions. But just briefly to introduce him to those who weren't there last night. In 1970, as he described uh, so passionately last night, um, he was uh, arrested for, together with a bunch of friends who were members of the Jewish underground movement for the terrible crime of wanting to leave Russia and go to the state of Israel. And not being permitted to do so, they came up with a plan to hijack a plane, not because they wanted anything from the Russian government, they weren't looking for the release of some crazy prisoner, and they weren't looking to um, get a lot of money. They simply wanted to land the plane in Sweden so that they could go from Sweden to the state of Israel. For that terrible crime, him and his friends were arrested. They were put on trial, a very famous trial, the Leningrad trial. And it became a show trial, Russians hoped it would be a show trial, where they would demonstrate that these people were vicious criminals. It didn't really work. But nevertheless, some of them were sentenced to death. Um, those sentences were later commuted. And some of them were sentenced to many years in jail. And jail in Soviet Russia didn't mean the type of jails that you have in California, where you, know, you have to have at least 32 channels on your TV, otherwise you can sue the state. Jail in Soviet Russia meant jail, hard labor. And I actually have been to the place where Rabbi Mendelevich was in jail, the Ural Mountains, in European Siberia. Section? Section 36. Exactly. And Sorry. Sharansky was? Sharansky was 35. I'm sure I'm just going to um, I didn't spend there long <laughs> enough, according to you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> they let me out. Um, it's a dreadful place. I'm not going to say anything more, but just by way of introduction, to say that Rabbi Mendelevich was the trigger for the decision by the Soviet authorities to let out tens of thousands of Jews and ultimately for the immigration of hundreds of thousands of Jews from Soviet, the Soviet Union. And he became literally the poster child, the poster person for the Let My People Go movement uh, in the 1970s. And I, along with my friends from school, used to demonstrate outside the Soviet embassy in Kensington in London with placards with his picture on them and with his name. And we used to send him letters to jail. I'm sure he never got them, but we still wrote them. And when he was released and came to London in 1982, he told me, yesterday it was a month before he got married, I said, I know, I remember, you told us then. In 1982, he visited our school. It was an incredibly seminal moment for us because it meant that God answered your prayers because we prayed for his release, and he was released, and there he was in front of us, telling us how important it was to believe in God. That was an incredibly important moment in my life. I haven't seen him since 1982. Last night was the first time, and... Um, it didn't change, right? <laughs> I'm just trying to think. No, you're exactly the same. <laughs> and so, without further ado, it's a great privilege and pleasure to host him here at our home and to have you here to listen to him. Please give a warm welcome to Rabbi Yosef Mendeley. Out of uh, many stories uh, yesterday, if you remember my handkerchief that I put on my head, I will demonstrate that the people that I believe everybody was there, but anyway, it was like I made my first Yarmulke for, uh, I, I lost my parent <coughs> and I made a handkerchief out from, um, uh, out from handkerchief, I make another parent. <coughs> Annoyed the guard, the officer, he was very angry with me. But um, it has uh, another story after I arrived, after being sentenced and uh, getting my 12 years of imprisonment, I arrived uh, to a uh, compulsory labor camp. And um, I looked for a friend, for a Jew, for there are hundreds and hundreds of prisoners, and I felt, uh, you know, that I'm lost. All of a sudden, 
I was approached by a young man and he told that he's Jewish. And he told me, you know, I dreamt that uh, somebody orthodox will come to the prison to teach me being religious, you know. For he told me I was arrested trying to improve the Russian government, like to make communism with human face. And now I understand that it was a mistake. And I would like to become an observing Jew, but I don't know anything like me previously. So teach me being Jewish. I told him, see, it's late at night. And again, it was a compulsory labor camp. We had to work uh, from morning till the, uh, till night. So let's go to sleep. I told him, tomorrow I will tell you the whole story. He told me, you can, you don't understand what you're take, talking about, you know. I hate myself being like a goy, and you tell me, wait another night. I demand, teach me now. <laughs> so as, as far as my knowledge was very limited, I could even standing on one leg. So I told, see, Shimon, nowadays it's a rather famous Russian rabbi in Israel, of Shimon Grilius. So I told him, Shimon, see. We have keep Shabbos, and we have to avoid eating trays, and then we have to smile inside and chumash and a sidur, and um, you know how much can I cover my head with a handkerchief? I have to produce a yarmulke. He told me nothing like that is possible. You know, it's a high security prison. Everything is forbidden. If you refuse to work in Shabbos, you will be punished for that. Put in a punishment room, and you will die there. And if you refuse eating their food, there is no other food. You will die. So there's, there's, so what to do, you know? And he told, to get a chumash and a cedar, they never published in Soviet Russia, no chumash and a cedar, how can you get one? But then he told me, you know what, you know, I have long, long pants, if we can, my pants, if we can get pieces of clothes, and I had, uh, he had a thread and a needle, which was a rarity, and if you can make a yarmulke for me and for yourself. So I made the yarmulke. So it is how the continuation of the story of this handkerchief. And uh, for the beginning, it was the first mitzvah. It was not exactly a big mitzvah, but at least he felt that we are doing something. Uh, after a while, I was stopped by a... Uh, officer in the prison, in the labor camp, and he told me, hey, what's on your hand? So I produced him a whole story that I used to tell the Russian uh, investigator under in Popov, exactly, a good memory, you have a good memory. <laughs> anyway, so I told the, you know, it's a Jewish tradition, whatever, uh, and he told me, okay, I understand that you are religious. It's no problem, you can be religious, but inside. Never demonstrate outside. When the moment you put a yarmulke, it's like a political manifestation, and you will be punished for that. And then he told me, look, I have a list of belongings that they are permitted to, uh, to have in a prison, and there is nothing like a yarmulke. So I will punish you not for being religious, but just violating the regime of the prison. Remove it at once. So I refused. Soldiers come throw me on the ground, hit me with their boots, took forcibly my yarmulke and that of uh, Shimon and told next time, if we're found, we will punish you in a punishment room. But uh, Shimon had more pants. <laughs> <laughs> so he produced uh, more yarmulke. And indeed it started. They would uh, punish us. Punish us for having a yarmulke, putting in a punishment room or uh, cutting uh, the food ratio. Anyway, we went on, and finally, after half a year, they got exhausted. They told you brought fanatic Jews here. You know, you, we can do add a salary. We will do it. It's a digital job to chase uh, the, the crazy Jews. So we felt that we won the battle, but not exactly. Later on, my father, Oliver Shalom, come to see me, and. Uh, we, were, we had the privilege to see once in a year a close relative. So coming to see him in a special room, before I was permitted to enter the room to see my father, I was stopped by an officer, and he told me, oh, you are violating our regime. 
Remove your earmark, otherwise uh, we, we shall cancel your meeting. I hesitated. I couldn't do it. I refused. So you are, your meeting is uh, cancelled. And they would never permit me to explain the real reason for that. And uh, the, the opposite, what they would say, you know, your son is a hijacker, is a criminal, he doesn't behave well. So my father would uh, write me telling, you know, please, please behave better, for I am an old man, maybe I will never anymore could see you. And I felt bad, and I can't explain. If I would be able to explain, maybe father, my father would understand me. So next year, my father arrived, and the same, you know. Stopped at the entrance of the room, remove your yarmulke. I felt bad, you know. I love my father, you know. And I was aware that having a yarmulke is not a big deal. It's not the, uh, the rice and not even the Ramona. But the moment I declared that it is a Jewish tradition, I understood the Arego Balia War. For before being arrested, somebody told me the story of a certain village, it is in Gimora, that um, uh, citizen Jews had uh, red leashes in uh, their boots. And they were demanding to move a red leashes. Well, the Goyim considered it's a Jewish tradition. They refused, they were killed for that. So it's, uh, you know, doesn't come together, uh, Yarmulke and red leashes. So obviously for me, it was. Impossible. So a year later on, my father came again and again, remove your yarmulke. I was almost crying, but I couldn't do anything. <coughs> For I understood that from one hand, it's like maybe Kabodava M, but it's my personal interest. And from one, another hand, I present whole army Israel. The Goyen have to understand that we are strong, that we never compromise. And then I did know something else. As we say, there is no kala, everything is important. No kala, no hamura, everything is important. For the moment you give up something small, the goyim will understand that you are a big person. They will push you to the wall and crush you all together as a human being. So you have to stand still and not to compromise. So it happened year after year until my father passed away and never could see him. Too bad. But still, Shimon was later released and he come to see my father and he explained the reason. So I believe before my father passed away, he felt comfortable, he was proud that um, it's exactly what he expected uh, from me to do. Uh, when he passed away, uh, that time the state secretary, Henry Kissinger, called President Brezhnev, the head of Russian government, and asked for permission to bring his, uh, my father's body to Kever Israel in Eretz Israel, so he is buried in Haraz Asim. The moment I was released, I come to see and I asked Michile. I believe he pardoned me for doing that. Ken, amen. Amen. So, another story about the Sidur, and then we, we shall start eating and uh, signing. For well, it's, uh, you know, Alan Gemaise to tell. It's all in, in the books. And I mentioned uh, that I draw up my tefillin and uh, I was prevented to daven there. They took away my tefillin, whatever. And exactly it happened later on when I was in a labor camp. We were aware that the guards are smuggling inside food. They were being, being uh, bribed by other guards, by prisoners, you know, and then they bring wood, bring chocolate, or vitamin, vodka, whatever, you know. So we indicated, not me specifically, for I had no uh, uh, possibility to see my relatives, but other Jewish friends uh, met their relatives, and they told this man could be bribed. So uh, the relatives approached him from another side of, of the fence and gave the money and asked uh, to smile inside. What? You know, a, a safer, a book. He was, uh, you know, he told, in a way, you know, for the moment they enter the prison, they were being searched. And they, he would say, if they found a bottle of vodka, so what everybody is drinking, you know? It's violation, but, <laughs> as but if they found a cedar, you know, it's a political crime. I will be punished for that. I can do it. <clears throat> so, well, Hashem, that time, American Jews helped a lot. So I don't know whether he gave up by, with $500 or more, but finally I was told that uh, they smuggled inside the Sidur, 
and uh, I was still in the factory. So they told, look uh, under, the, under your port, there is a your cedar. So coming back, and you can imagine the barracks of uh, tens, hundreds of prisoners in it. I come to my board, lifted the mattress, and I see a beautiful cedar. <laughs> But it exactly was a problem, you know. It was that beautiful that Russia would never produce it. So I couldn't use it. For We were surrounded by former collaborators, that, uh, like Ukrainian policemen that served the Nazis, and they hated us. That time they cooperated with the Nazis. Now they cooperated with the communists, and they would inform every our uh, illegal movement. So I couldn't use it. They like, say, to have and not to have. So I decided I will go voluntarily to work at night. They would work around the clock, three shifts, and the most hated certainly was the night shift. So I would go at night, like uh, 11 p.m. up to 6 a.m. Coming back to the barrack, it was empty, so I could have using my, my, my safer. And then I come to another idea. Maybe I will copy down my cedar in small pieces of paper. So I produced something like that. It's an example in a matchbox. And if you look inside, is it filler there? So I could stand and down. The moment the guard would enter to, to have a check in the, in, in the barrack, I closed my matchbox. Every Russia is a heavy smoker having matchboxes. So I could uh, put it in my pocket. Oh, Hashem. Then I decided I will make another copy. So this one, I cover it with a plastic bag and put it under the ground. And when I finish to produce another copy, and you can imagine me sitting between two boards, very tense, copying down in small pieces of paper and watching the door for the moment the uh, supervisor will enter. I have to put it on the mattress and escape. So finally, I made the second copy, and all of a sudden I felt I remember everything by memory. For you people it's uh, something regular, but uh, nobody taught me that. So it is how, you know, I remembered everything. Every shach is min beautiful. I understood that I got another dimension of freedom. Why? For, imagine me in a punishment uh, room, in a punishment cell. You are stripped almost naked, you don't have anything, you're not permitted to have anything, and you stay alone day after day, week after week, you can get crazy with that. But I had my feeling. In the morning, I could stood up, saying, you know, Carbones, Peter Martore, whatever, and then Psuki de Simre, mentioning, Oi, Avram Avinu, David Amelech, like, you know, I felt that I escaped out. I am not anymore in the cell. I'm <coughs> far away with my obvious, with the tzaddikim. Beautiful. It's why I would stretch my shachris <laughs> for three hours, you know, singing out every syllable, you know, enjoying, understanding that I am free. I am really free. So finally, after three hours, how can you stretch? You know, maybe Nati can do it even more. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you, okay. you had this experience okay. yes. in the punishment room. Let's check. You want to put them in the punishment room? <laughs> Get them, <little> kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Nati is a friend of my son in Israel, so yeah. we never know before he arrived. Yeah. Anyway, so, and then, after how much you can stretch it, you know, the hours, and that's finished. What to do else? But now is the time of Minche, and then Zmeir, you are busy. I don't, I can't imagine what other prisoner would do. Maybe it's why they would give up, <coughs> they broken. But not me, you know, I can stand for a longer time. And then, when outside, not always I was in a punishment room, I had another problem, Shachrit. We were not permitted to walk out from the barrack because, be, before getting up. And after getting up, we had to go directly to the factory. So I had no time for, for shachrit. But there was another benefit. They built a toilet for the prisoners far away from the barracks. So imagine at night you have to go 
for your biological needs in winter, cold, in the snowing, and people would stay in the barrack, you know. But I used it. In the early morning, I would come up and I dig, I, I dig a shelter in, a, in snow. The snow was my high. So I dig a shelter in the snow close to the passageway, bringing me to the toilet and standing there in downing. In winter, it, it was a cold winter, uh, snow is scratching, scratching under the foot. When the guard would step, I heard from distance and I could escape like I am going to the toilet. So, and then, you know, once I was caught by an officer standing there in the snow, what are you doing there? So I told, you know, I'm going to the toilet. Don't cheat us. You are doing something against our power. You know, they stripped me naked, look my old belongings, but my trio was in my hands. So I couldn't find it. <coughs> so he told me, I don't, I don't know exactly what, what you are standing here, but I know that it is against the uh, Soviet government. So next time I found you in, um, in snow, you'll be punished for that. So, Baruch Hashem, you know, and uh, another story, when um, um, I mentioned you that uh, I kept Shabbos in prison as well, and this is another story, but to continue the issue of a Siddur, when I was sentenced for keeping Shabbos for two years of imprisonment in a different prison, I was sent to the specific prison, and I got on the way my Siddur, so I figured, how I can smuggle inside the prison a real sidro. And I had an idea. We were permitted to request uh, newspapers published in Russian. And I re requested an only one uh, bulletin in Yiddish called Sovetish Hamlet, uh, Russian Sovetish motherland. Once they sent me an edition copy with a newspa newspaper of Sovetish Hamlet and a book. What was the book? Speeches of Comrade Brezhnev translated in Yiddish. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was glad that a, a clever Jew made a parnosa translating uh, the speeches. But um, when sent to this uh, specific prison, I decided I will have this uh, Yiddish book to train me in Yiddish, you know, at least something to do there. And then uh, looking to these uh, 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 Brezhnev speeches, and my Siddur, I saw that it's the same format. format. And in the first page of uh, regional speeches that were written in Yiddish, which is our base. And their beneath was written in Russian, permitted by Russian government, in Russian language, published in Moscow. So I took the first page <laughs> from uh, the Brezhnev speeches and made some glue from bread, chewed bread. And it makes amylan and put it, glue it inside, inside my cedar. So I believe it was the first cedar legally published in Soviet Russia. <laughs> <laughs> I entered the prison. They told you are permitted to have five books published in Soviet Russia. He checked, okay, it's published in Soviet Russia. You can have it. I had a, only one problem. Pesach, I couldn't use it, you know, for I saw the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, much more story. I copied down my cedar in small pieces of paper that I could keep it in a matchbox. Would it uh, would make me easier to daven? And the moment the guard would enter, I could uh, close my matchbox and put it in my pocket, so nobody could uh, discover what I am doing. So it's uh, two small stories.